to be occasionally coughing through the, 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 the talk because I just recovered from COVID. So thank you, COVID, for that. OK, um, let's go. So let's start by a motivating example. Consider this, this the uh, healthcare problem, the patient treatment problem. Uh, so this is a problem that now has sparked a lot of interest among people how to apply machine learning and in particular reinforcement learning to healthcare problems. So the problem is as follows. We have a patient that comes to medical centers that have this vector of features, which can be vital, symptoms, demographic, medical history, really any measure that we have on the patients. <clears throat> then the doctor observing the physician observes these features and then prescribe a treatment on a set of possible treatments that we can prescribe. And then outcome is observed that can be whether the patient dies or survives or, or his, his uh, situation improves or, uh, or actually becomes worse. And in reality, how things work is that uh, this is not really a one step process. This is more like a sequential decision making process where at each step the patient comes with some given features, the, the physician give him a treatment and the patient comes back to the hospital. We observe new features, his vitals change. And then we keep treating the patient until at the end we observe an outcome. So this is really a sequential decision-making problem. And the question is how to find from historic data the optimal treatment policy, which means for any new patient that comes with some given treatments, I want to know from this, for, so with some given features, I want to know from his features, what is the optimal uh, treatment to prescribe. And the data that we observe is kind of something like that. It's just multiple paths of different patients toward the, the healthcare system with different action, the different um, treatments given, and then uh, different features observed, and then an outcome. And the question is from this data, from this historical clinical data, can we actually create and design the optimal uh, treatment? So what is particular about this problem? And we will see that this is really common features between many, many important applications. So this is the reinforcement learning setting, which is basically means we want to do machine learning in a sequential decision-making problem that has a continuous state space, which means these features that we observe, these are continuous vectors. There's not a finite uh, set of possible states where the, the, the patients can be. It's really continuous vectors that we observe. So the data, if we kind of represent it, it looks like this. We have some point in the space that keeps evolving toward the space when it takes different actions. And then at the end of the path, we observe an outcome. For example, the patient starts at this point, these features in the space, and then takes uh, this orange action or treatment, and then the green action that just keep evolving through this space. And at the end of the day, what we observe is there's this collection of data points and this collection of dynamics in the space. And we're given a new patient, so a new point in this space with new features that we never observed before because this is continuous. And the question is, what is the optimal policy to prescribe to these new patients? The second problem is that we cannot explore the system in this scenario. We cannot, most reinforcement learning algorithms are based on this idea of trial and error. We have a chess, for example, or Go or any games. We just keep trying new actions, trying new decisions and see whether they actually go towards something with high reward or with low reward. And then using these ideas, we kind of learn from the system. And this is really a fundamental idea in the paradigms of reinforcement learning, but this is not something we can do in healthcare and actually in most real life high risk settings. We cannot explore, we cannot try new treatments on patients just to learn uh, more about this treatment. And the third challenge that we have, and this is also a very important challenge, is that in higher risk settings, such as healthcare, we need interpretability. And I think, for, especially for everybody at RC, we did, Professor did stress this enough for you that interpretability is important. For example, in healthcare, imagine we have this great reinforcement learning algorithm that works perfectly with neural networks, but at the end of the day, it gives us a recommendation that we need to prescribe to a patient. But then if it, we cannot really fully rely on this black box algorithm to treat a patient because at the end of the day, who's responsible for these treatments and what if it doesn't work? The person who makes the decision is the physician. And so he, he, uh, he or she has to be based uh, the decision on some interpretable output of the algorithm. So these are really key challenges, not only in healthcare, but in general in the apl applicability of reinforcement learning in real life, especially that now reinforcement learning seems so advanced because of the success in games, but in 
actually not it is not as much applied in real life settings as, as we would want it to be. So what, what was done before? What are the existing methods to tackle this problem where we cannot explore and we have this continuous state space? So the first really naive idea is we have something continuous, we cannot deal with it because even if you have a lot of data, it's still continuous, we still don't have enough information. So we'll just discretize the state space, we'll just discretize it and then we have something finite. And then we would hope to, for each state, for each square in this discretization, we hope to observe enough data points to understand what is happening in the system and to try to model the system as something that is finite and do some averaging with the data that we have or uh, to, to be able to estimate some MDP or Markov distance process that models the system. So essentially, this is one idea, discretization. But the problem is that this is very inefficient because the discretization essentially is, is just a naive one. In general, just a grid or something based on the, the user that, that knows this, uh, this system. So it can be very inefficient and it will require a large data set because we need to have data that fills all the squares in this discretization to be able to learn the system. This is kind of the most straightforward way to, to do things, but it's very inefficient. Um, the other way is also a very natural way is to say, okay, let's do some machine learning and try to approximate the information that we want on this system. So suppose we have some feature here, the point that is represented X. And the idea is we try to approximate with the regression all the rewards of my function, of my space, given the data that we observe. So we just do a regression to estimate all the rewards. This is relatively fine, we can do it. And then the second thing that we need to do is we need to approximate the transitions. We ne I need to know that for every X and A, just as represented in the figure here, I want to approximate what would be the next point I go to when I am in X and I take action A. So I approximate these transitions, and this is also can be done through regression or neural networks. But the problem is this function f that we want to learn, these transitions in this continuous space are very complex, especially in real life setting where things, if you want to learn, this requires kind of, you're trying to learn exactly what would happen to a patient with some exact features, you know, about blood pressure that is 2.71345 and age, which is uh, 20.5. So you want to learn really exactly for each scenario what's going to happen to your patient. And this is really a complex learning problem that obviously will require complex approximators. And this is essentially why most successful reinforcement learning algorithms require neural networks and actually complex neural networks. And we say is neural networks, complex approximators, it just breaks interpretability. Okay, so this is what, what is done essentially. Oh, and for, for those of you who are familiar with Q values, this is essentially equivalent to approximating the Q values of the, of the, of the system. Okay. So this is what was done, what is done essentially in the literature. Now the question is, can we design some interpretable offline reinforcement learning approach? And by offline, I mean no exploration. I cannot explore my system. And I want this to learn efficiently from the data and effectively from the data. I want it not only to do this discretization that it's gonna be efficient, but I want it to try to exploit as uh, the best possible the data to do what, what it, my, my objective is, which is estimate the optimal policy. Okay, and the idea of, of this new approach that, that I will show you comes essentially from the way doctors or actually any practitioner essentially uh, design these decisions that we apply in real life. For example, here, this is a table that I took from uh, treatment guidelines for arterial blood pressure management, arterial hypertension management. And we can see that is a pretty, natural way of, of uh, writing these treatments is that we have some decision tree form. So we de decide what are some conditions on the features. For example, we want the age to be in certain range. We want the blood pressure, which is SBP here, to be in a certain range and some information about the medical history. So this is kind of drawing some decision tree in the feature space and saying, if the patient's feature are in this region, then prescribe this treatment. It's essentially constructing a decision tree. To, to make the decision. And it suggests that there's some inherent treatment groups among the patients and in the features. And the question is actually, can we learn these treatment groups? If they do exist, these inherent groups of patients that do behave the same, can we actually learn these groups? And so it will allow us to simplify the system. And precisely what is happening <coughs> is that 
The idea is to partition this feature space such that in every part of this partition, everything there behaves the same way in the sense that if they get the same treatments, then they will transition to the same parts. Essentially, we want a similar behavior among the same uh, group. And this will allow, if, if we could construct such a representation, and I will detail later exactly what we mean by constructing this representation, we will be able to find the optimum policy and estimate contrafactuals because we can construct this reduced representation of the system. It gives us interpretability, this idea of treatment groups that is happening there. And then it enhances structurability because we're going to move from something continuous to something that is discrete. Okay, so in the reminder of the talk, what we will do is that we will define formally what we mean by this representation of the system that I keep saying. And in general, we will define what is the most concise representation that we want to learn from the system. We'll talk about how to learn it from data. Then we'll present an algorithm that does this learning. And then I'll show you some cool experiments. Okay, so what is a representation of the system? I have this dynamic system, these continuous things that move in my feature space. And what I want is to be able to partition it into groups, into these clusters, and then construct some MDP and map every region in this partition to a state of the MDP, just like I do here. So every part of this partition will correspond to a state of an MDP, and then I will construct my dy dynamics of this MDP. And by doing this, I took a continuous dynamic system on the right. And by doing this partition, I transformed it into a discrete mark of decision process. And I want to do this in an optimal way, right? I don't want to do this naive discretization, which will have a lot of state spaces and will scale exponentially with the dimension. I want to do it in some optimal way and also some way that is inherent to the dynamic system. For example, in healthcare, I would find these treatment groups that are inherent to the actual healthcare problem. So what does this translate mathematically? What does it mean mathematically? Suppose we have this feature space X. So this is this 2D board that I have on the right. And we have an action space A, for example, the possible treatments. We have a transition function that models, this is the true transition function that models a dynamic system, which is this F that gives me my next point where I'm in some point and I take some action. We have a reward function that tells me what is the reward at every feature, possible feature. And then I want to construct a partition, which is phi here. This is the blue partition that I constructed here. That obeys the two following conditions. And again, the math might seem a little bit uh, hard to read at the beginning, but uh, in the figure, it looks actually pretty simple. So let's see exactly what it means in the figure. What I want is for every two points that I take that belong to the same cluster, for example, these two points here, if they have reward R1 and R2, I want these rewards to be equal. This makes sense, right? Every two points that belong to the same group should behave the same and therefore should have the same reward. This is the first condition that I want in this clustering. The second condition is for every action, say for example, the green action, whenever two, uh, so let's start by the orange action, whenever two points in the same cluster take the same action, for example, here the orange one, I want them to go to the same group in this clustering, right? So for example, if they took also the green action, they would go to the same group in the clustering. So this is really the two conditions that I require. If I have a partition that verifies these two conditions, a clustering that verifies these two conditions, then I will call this a valid representative of the system. And essentially this can be mapped into this MDP that we've seen before. So really whenever I have these two conditions verifying a partition, this gives me an, an MDP that models the system. And ideally what I want to learn is the most concise partition, right? With the least number of parts, the least number of states. And this will be my objective because this is somehow, I compressed all the information in this uh, continuous system into this small partition. So this is kind of the smallest MDP that can represent my, my system. Therefore, this is the most tractable, the most interpretable. Um, and this is exactly what I want to learn. Okay, and the good thing about so what this definition give us this representation is that it preserves the values of the dynamic system. So what are the values? Just quickly, the values are essentially the cumulative reward, the total reward that I can collect taking some actions A1 to, to AH. Uh, this is somehow what I want to learn because if I have these values, I can find the optimal policy that maximizes this value. 
So these values are kind of the essential information in the dynamic system. And what I'm saying here by this proposition is that my representation preserves the values. So I can find, recover the values of the dynamic system only from this concise, reduced, summarized representation. So the representation has all the information I need. So this is why, this is exactly what we need to learn. So the objective now is given data that I observe from dynamic system, this is, think of it as a relatively scarce data from this dynamic system, continuous dynamic system. The objective is to learn the most concise representation. We can actually show that it, this, this, this minimal, what I call minimal representation is actually unique. And this is the target that I want to learn. So what I observe is a data that looks like that in the figure, right? Multiple points, multiple actions, and things that are a little bit scattered all over the space. And what I want to learn is this partition that verifies these conditions that I mentioned earlier and will give me a mirror representation. But the problem is that this is not a supervised learning problem because I don't know anything about this partition except that it exists. For example, if you give me two points, I cannot even tell you if they are in the same partition. I don't have this information. If I had the points labeled, labeled with the cluster they should belong to, I can just do, uh, I can just do uh, some supervised clustering and then I would learn my partition, but I don't have that, right? So I cannot, this is not, it's not, this becomes a not supervised problem. Um, and in general, in machine learning, what do we do is we just design some error in sample that we want to minimize. And we hope that minimizing this in sample error will give us something that behaves well out of sample. But here, to learn a mirror representation, we don't even have an in sample error that we can define. So this is, makes the problem very challenging. And the challenge is only from observing this data to recover this inherent uh, representation of the system, this minimal representation of the system, only from the data. So how do we do that? This is where comes the notion of coherence. So coherence is an in-sample notion of some partition that I suggest of the future space. For example, here, I suggest this dashed red partition. And this is going to be an in-sample property of this partition. And it's somehow, think of it as the least thing we would expect from a good partition. right? So this is almost a necessary condition for something to be at least close to the mirror representation. So what is coherence? Let me, let me explain it again in a figure, which will be easier than, than the mathematical definition. So what I want is, now I have data points. Remember, what I see here are just data points that I observed. For every two data points, if they belong to the same group in my partition, this is a partition that I constructed, I want them to share the same reward, okay? And if they took the same action in the data, and remember, the data that we observe, every point, every data point takes one action. This is the one that I observed in the data. I do not see the alternative possibilities, the alternative actions. So if two points like the ones I circled here took the same action, here they took the same orange action, I want them to, <coughs> to transition to the same group, okay? And similarly here, these two data points that I circled uh, took the green action, both of them, so I want them to transition to the same group. This is kind of an in-sample version of this definition of mirror representation, right? And you, you kind of feel that this is necessary somehow. I need this to be verified, at least if I want to be close to minimal representation. And the pretty surprising things and actually very positive things is that this condition is not only necessary, it's also sufficient. This is, this is what we prove. Oh yeah, and one example of something that is not coherent is suppose here that I partitioned further my feature space with this like green, um, this green split, then this is not a coherent partition anymore because I have two points, uh, the one R1 and R2 that took the, the same action, orange action, but transitioned to different clusters. So what we prove is that this coherent uh, property that is fairly simple and actually very natural is sufficient to convert to your presentation. And let me detail what I mean. Okay, so we assume that, and this is not important if you're not familiar with VC dimension, but, but we assume that the hypothesis class of this mirror representation that we want to learn is a finite VC dimension. What does that mean? It just means that we assume that this partition that we want to learn, the mirror representation, is not too complex. It's not has some weird shapes or forms. It's essentially something learnable, kind of. 
And then I suggest some partition. This is the red partition that I suggested that is coherent with the data that I observe. And what I'm interested in is in the difference between the two, this uh, red dashed region, which is the difference between the partition that I constructed and the mean representation. This is the error that I do in my learning process. And what I want is to quantify this error. How close we are, are we to the mean representation with the coherent partition? And what we prove is that this error, the in-sample and the out-of-sample error, converges to zero with more data size. So here n is the number of trajectories that we have, and h is the horizon. So n times h is the total data size. And we show a PAC bound with a bound with high probability that it suffices to have this coherent partition with the data size to converge to the mirror representation of the system. And furthermore, what we can show is that this representation that I construct, when I take the MDP associated to it, so this is MDP representation, I can show that the values of this constructed MDP converge to the values of the dynamic system. The optimal value and all in general, the values converge. And so <clears throat> this means that just by constructing this minimal, this coherent representation, I preserved all the information that I needed from the, um, from the system and I converge the most concise representation of the system. Said in other words, learning, just constructing a coherent representation with the data is a guaranteed process to converge to the mean representation. And this is really what I want to learn. <clears throat> okay. Um, just a few more comments for those of you who really like statistical learning. This tells us essentially something pretty cool, that there's this famous result by, by Vapnik in statistical learning that says that if you have some binary classification problem and you construct any classifier that agrees with the data, then you know that out of sample, you're gonna ultimately converge to the true classification. This is kind of equivalent to that. Agreeing with the data in binary classification is equivalent somehow to being coherent with transition data when we wanna learn uh, repre uh, um, dynamic representation of the system. So we kind of extend this fundamental statistical learning bound to the dynamic system. And again, this is just a curiosity uh, comment. Uh, okay, now, okay, I gave you this ensemble property coherence um, that is guaranteed to convert, the grades obeys everything that I want. But the question is how do I learn, how do I construct this coherence uh, can this coherence partition from data. How, just given data, do I construct this coherence partition? And this is where comes the MR algorithm. So this is the algorithm that you suggest that we call minimal representation learning. And it takes this data and it's partition it in a coherent way and therefore learns this representation that will converge to mean representation. So how is it done? It's actually fairly, fairly intuitive. So we do it in two steps. First, we cluster all the data points by their rewards. So suppose I have all my data points on my right figure here. And suppose I observe all the rewards here. I have like three, three types of rewards, R0, R1, and R2. What I do is just I do some supervised learning to partition it by reward. This is the first step. Second step, whenever I find some incoherence, something that breaks this coherence property, and again, Coherence just means that if I am in the same cluster, I need to transition to the same cluster if I took the same action. Whenever I have some cluster that does not obey this property, I just split it so it obeys this property. So what's happening is, for example, this cluster is not coherent. And why? Because if you look at these two red circled points, they took, the, they took orange action and they transitioned to some cluster. But the purple circled points, they took also the orange action, but they transitioned to a different cluster. This is not coherent. So what I do is that ju I just use supervised learning on these points to split this cluster. And now I have something that is coherent. And I just keep doing so until I eliminate all coherences and I have a coherent representation. So in general, what in conclusion, what the MRL does is that it just takes data and it constructs a concise representation of the system. And this is exactly the, the objective that we set it at the beginning is from some data of the dynamic system, we just construct a representation that allows us to get the optimal policy and estimate values. Okay, so now I'll just show you some pretty funny experiments that shows a little bit how all this concept that I've been explaining to you uh, work in practice. 
So let's take some simple example. Let's take a maze environment, right? We have this five uh, times five maze. We start at some points in this space and think of it as a two dimensional board. I can be at any point in this board. So say I start in this starting cell at some point in the starting cell, like the blue point. <coughs> and then at each step, I can take action either up, down, left, or right. So if I took take action right here, what happens is that I go to the corresponding cell, the cell that is on the right of the cell that I'm actually in, but I will fall on some random coordinate in this cell. For example, I can follow this coordinate here, or here, or here, or here, and it's going to be random. And at each step, I keep taking my actions and just going through this maze, this two-dimensional continuous maze. Uh, and for example, if I took an action that would go into a wall, I will just stay in my current cell, just like here. Then I just keep going until I reach my goal. So this is what a walker does. And then what I observe, what I'm given is just a data of some worker that already explored the system. And think of it just as healthcare. I'm just given historic data of previous uh, sequences of treatments. So here I'm giving just historic data of previous walks in this maze. And I don't know what the maze is. I don't even know that it's a maze. I don't see the walls. I don't know that there exist these cells. I only know that someone took these walks and this is what I observe. And I just see uh, several of these walks. And the challenge is to learn a representation of the seemingly continuous system uh, into, some, into a concise representation, ideally the most concise representation. And when we run the MRL algorithm on this example, what we get is the following. And this is really cool. Why? Just because the algorithm just from these trajectories understood that this is actually a maze and understood exactly where the cell, that there exists some cells that are actually a good representation of the system. And these are the ones that are colors, colored here uh, on, the, on the right figure. It also understood the wall, and it also understood the effects of each action. So for example, the representation that I give from, from this figure tells me if you are in this uh, uh, blue colored cell and you take this action, this is in the next cell where you go to. So the algorithm understood by itself what is the most concise representation of a maze, which is just simply the maze itself. And we can do more further detailed analysis and we can just generate different data sets and different types of data sets with different sizes. And then we can plot the error uh, with these different data sets. And this error is essentially the difference between this colored representation that I learned and the actual maze. And we see that this error decreases asymptotically to zero. And so the representation that I learned, this coloring here, the space converges exactly to the maze when I have more data size. <coughs> and using this representation, we use it to, to find a policy. We take the policy, the, the optimal policy of this representation that is suggested to us. We try it on the maze and we compare the values that we get. And so when we compare the values here, this is the curve that we get. Uh, and it just tells us that the optimal policy that I derive from the representation converges to the optimal policy of the actual maze. And we see that it, the convergence happens with more and more data size and it ultimately converges to zero. So this means that basically all that I've been telling you, it works not only in theory, which is what we proved, but it also works in practice um, as, as we see here. Okay, now let's look at a little bit of more concrete example. And what concrete example would we pick other than COVID, which is what is kind of ruining all the words right now and making us doing this on Zoom. So let's consider the COVID example. So why is COVID relevant in this case? It's because it also can be seen as a dynamic system. So the data that I observe in COVID is some regions. So here, okay, I put it Africa, Asia, and, and Australia, just because I didn't find states of the US in PowerPoint, but think of this you know, as New York, Massachusetts, Florida, et cetera. We have all these regions. And for each region, what I observe is some COVID path, right? At each step, I see some features of, the, of this region that can be, the mobility of the population, how much people move, the growth rate that is in the population, the restrictive measure, all the information that I have in this region that makes it particular, right? I observe also the growth rate of the region at each step. And then at each step, the government takes some decisions. So these are, you know, the little government people that are represented there next to the actions. Each step, there is an action that is taken and then new features are observed and the new growth rates 
and the region keep evolving, like Massachusetts just keep evolving through time. And when I accumulate all this information, I have an outcome, which is either the curve is flattened, the growth rate is very high, the growth rate is very low, or I have an explosion in the number of cases. So really, this is somehow an important learning setting as well. This is the dynamic setting. And I can see COVID as the evolution of some dynamic system of some mark of decision, continuous mark of decision process. And so I can apply exactly what I've seen before. Oh, and let me specify that the actions that we consider here are the government's measure, but it can be really any actions that you can think about. So I can apply all what I've seen before, and, what, and we do this. So what we do is we take this MR algorithm, we apply it to COVID, we get a representation, and we use the representation to make predictions. And let me show, yeah, and let me maybe detail a little bit more how this representation works for COVID in particular. So we have this feature space of COVID, and again, the features can be uh, mobility, uh, growth rate, etc. So a region here, just like I represented, is essentially some combination of conditions on the mobility, the growth rate, the temperature. So this region of the feature space will be all the regions of the US, the states of the US at a certain time that had these particular features. And then I will map each region to a set of an MDP and I get an MDP representation that represents the evolution of COVID. Oh, this is maybe a little bit late in the talk, but feel free to stop me if you have any question. I should have said that before. But yeah, I, I might talk a little bit fast, but stop me if you have any, any question, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so I get this representation MDP uh, that represents COVID. And now to make a prediction, what I do is take, for example, Massachusetts at some time. I map it to where it belongs in the feature space. And I see then to what states this corresponds to in the MDP. And I keep just evolving in the MDP until I get my prediction. And then I, at the end of the MDP, I will get Massachusetts at time t plus like three delta t here. And I can tell delta t like three days or something like that. OK. So what are the results? So we did this with and really applied the basic MR algorithm. We did not even. Uh, so we adapted obviously to COVID and et cetera, but we, this is not really sp specifically built for COVID. This is a general algorithm that is just applied uh, to COVID. And what we get are actually pretty promising results. So what I the tables that I will show you here, I will show uh, three or four, are tables of all the models that are used by the CDC. Uh, so this is models constructed by different universities and companies that are given to the CDC. And each for each prediction, there is this ranking of all the models uh, depending on how precise the prediction was, uh, of how precise the prediction was of um, of COVID cases and death uh, and etc. And this is then you get this ranking. So the CDC keeps, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the top 50 models uh, that are given to to it. And each time I'm going to show you the, the the ranking. And you see here, uh, we'll, we will observe that MRL consistently uh, ranked among the top 14, say 15 models. And it just keep alternating these 15 models. And at, even at some point, the, it becomes the best performing model among all the CDC models. And here there's also some, and the, good, the cool thing also is among these top 50 models, there's a lot of ORC models. So there's Delphi that appears many times here. There's KNN, which is developed by Yanis, by LSTM, by, by Asteri, who I think there might be in the, in the talk. Um, so yeah, ORC is performing pretty well in, in COVID prediction. But anyway, what I wanted to show you is that MRL uh, and this idea not only gives this interpretability and this representation, but only also performs very well in terms of benchmarking it against reinforcement learning, uh, other algorithms. Okay, so what have we done in this talk? Uh, we had this objective of, we have some dynamic systems, say patient treatments, for example, <coughs> and we observe only historic data. We cannot explore, we cannot try new things. And from this data, what we want is to have, to learn some representation of this system. And ideally the most concise representation of the system, because this representation will give us interpretability, will explain the system just from the data, will give us the optimal quality that we want to extract, will give us contrafactuals, we can estimate what's gonna happen if we took these actions in the system. And will also allow us to solve a seemingly intractable problem, a seemingly continuous problem as a more concise and discrete problem. And what we suggest is a novel approach. This is a completely novel approach in reinforcement learning that is completely different from all that is done with function approximators, fitted Q iteration, policy gradient, et cetera. 
It's a novel way of looking at reinforcement learning that has the following advantages. It takes the data, construct this representation, it provides the user with this interpretable representation, it deals with the continuous state space with this discretization and concise representation idea, and it handles the inability uh, to explore the system. It does not need to explore the system to learn, and it makes the problem uh, more tractable. So there's a paper about this that we just submitted, um, and I'd be very happy if you I will check it out. If you have any comments or suggestions, I'd be very more than happy to, 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 to hear that. And by saying this, if you have any questions or comments or suggestions on, uh, on what they just presented to you today, I'd be very happy to, to hear it. Thank you for listening.